We have five presentations that are going to happen today. There's going to be, each presentation is going to be about 12 minutes long, and there's going to be a three-minute break between where the presenter can answer questions while the next presenter sets up, uh, sets up their talk. So again, so you know, wait and ask your questions at the end. And if it takes a little bit longer than that, I'll probably try to cut everyone off so that we can get out of here on time. But you can catch the presenters afterwards to ask them questions. So again, this was a competitive process on who got to do an oral presentation. So uh, I hope you enjoy these. The first one is by Riley Austin. He is a marine biology major. He has a minor in applied mathematics, and his advisor is James Sulikowski. And he's going to talk to us about an assessment of stress and post-release mortality in Atlantic cod caught in the commercial lobster fishery. So this is the research I've been conducting over the past two years uh, under James Sulikowski. Uh, I've learned a lot while doing it, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So the Atlantic cod was once the most important commercially caught fish species in New England. Um, in the 1850s, their stock or their, pop, their landings were estimated at about 80,000 metric tons. But due to continuously uh, heavy fishing pressure, uh, their stocks have collapsed and biomass has reached an all-time uh, historic low. But due to But in order to restore the species, we must understand uh, uh, important factors that are leading to their decline. So some factors that have been cited as uh, possible, um, possibly leading to their decline are uh, climate change, uh, dynamic predator-prey interactions, and bycatch or the, non the incidental capture of the non-targeted species uh, in other New England fisheries. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So uh, an issue that uh, the Marine Stewardship Council has recently cited was that uh, 177 metric tons of cod were discarded in the lobster fishery uh, in 2008. The lobster fishery is an extremely large fishery uh, around here, and an important one. Uh, there's all, at any given time, there's 3.5 million uh, traps in just state waters in Maine alone. So because cod are a demersal fish that uh, like to hang out at the bottom, there's a high probability that uh, they could be caught. Um, so we need to understand uh, how that they interact with uh, lobster traps and the mortality that could be uh, observed. So when fish get captured, they suffer stress. And um, so when they do suffer stress, uh, primary response is uh, evoked and uh, cortisol and catecholamines are released. This is part of the flight or flight response. Um, and this can lead, if prolonged, this can lead to secondary uh, response in which uh, meta like metabolic changes can occur, uh, increases in glucose and lactate. And if uh, stress is prolonged over months or is chronic, uh, this can lead to population changes in which uh, the tertiary response will be observed and uh, whole body changes such as decreases in uh, recruitment and uh, fitness uh, can be observed. So my objectives were to use physiological, physical, and reflex measures to determine the magnitude of physiological disturbance uh, associated with the capture and lobster gear. So it, throughout the months of May to October, uh, commercial uh, lobster trips were taken with a commercial lobster fisherman. Uh, here he is, Ed Hutchins, uh, pictured with a gnarly looking wolfish. Um, uh, it was uh, taken 15 minutes south of here in Cape Porpoise. Um, industry standard lobster gear was used, baited with some absolutely lovely smelling menhaden uh, herring and with the occasional addition of uh, some cowhide. So you've never smelled anything worse than that. Uh, the, these lobster traps were sampled, as you can see in this map. Um, this, this was actually the 2017 uh, sampling sites. Um, after each haul, uh, abiotic measurements were taken, uh, depth, um, soak time, um, bottom, surface, and air temperature were also taken, as well as GPS location. Following the capture of a cod, 
Uh, we immediately began assessing it, uh, taking total and pre-call length. Uh, we also measure these reflex action mortality predictors um, based on whether they are present or not. Uh, one was muscle resistance, two was a perculum flex for respiration, and uh, three was the swim, swim response once we released them. We also scored them on an injury of one to four, uh, one being excellent, and believe it or not, the four is actually still alive. Uh, whether uh, four was uh, categorized as moribund or near death. Um, we also tagged them with a T-bar spaghetti tag, which had ID and uh, inf contact information in case of uh, recapture. Then right before we released them, a uh, milliliter of blood was collected. On board, we measured glucose, lactate, and hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin with the red meter, uh, uh, glucose with the blue, and lactate with the yellow. Um, then ice was stored on, on, then blood was stored on ice until it could be brought back to the lab where we took a capillary tube, uh, filled it with whole blood, centrifuged it down, and then we could determine the percent red blood cells. Uh, then the rest of the blood was uh, centrifuged down, plasma was pipetted off, and uh, cortisol was quantified using radioaminoassay. So 50 cod were caught in uh, the sampling years of 2016 and 2017. Uh, you can see uh, high catch between the months of May and July, and then uh, catch slowly declines as the waters warm up and cod move offshore. Our sample size consisted, the majority of our sample size consisted of injury one and injury two cod, with uh, injury three and four uh, representing marginal uh, at only two and four percent. We also took a subset of control cod to uh, compare against our uh, stress cod for uh, baseline values. 60% uh, of, of the cod caught were um, exhibited all three uh, reflex action mortality predictors. And then here we have glucose on the y-axis as well as hemoglobin uh, over uh, injury on the x-axis. Uh, if you can see there's no apparent trends here and uh, across injury, it was highly variable. Variable, um, and after running analysis of variance, uh, both turned out insignificant uh, p-values of 0.235 and 0.07. Uh, here we have uh, cortisol, hematocrit, and lactate on the y-axis across injury on the x-axis. Uh, we noticed a significant increase in cortisol across injury, uh, significant decrease in hematocrit and a significant increase in lactate. The significant increase in lactate is primarily due to cod uh, thrashing around in lobster gear as they use the glucose that is um, mobilized by cortisol uh, through um, glycolysis. Uh, you can see a, a pronounced primary stress response uh, in cortisol with a uh, max value of 900 nanograms per milliliter. This is actually the highest reported value that has uh, uh, been seen in, in across the literature. Um, I think the, the highest reported value was like 500 nanograms per milliliter. So that's very interesting. And then we can also see this decrease in hematocrit. Uh, the types of injuries associated with lobster gear uh, oftentimes um, take off a lot of the scales and expose uh, uh, these fish to uh, an influx of ions. Um, this leads to an osmoregulatory stress. Uh, here we have a table of max cortisol values across different stressors and capture in, in different uh, uh, fisheries. Uh, the, uh, besides the heat and handling, our uh, injury one and two cod were actually comparable to uh, these other studies, which max value is probably around 250. So something, uh, even though soak time wasn't a significant predictor of uh, stress, so it's something that we should consider because uh, these cod, we, our soak times range from two to 14 days. So cod can be in the trap any number of days for extremely long. Um, and then it becomes even more important when we consider all the, the gear that's been lost at sea. Because um, they could be suffering mortality in there as well as stress. Uh, so overall, in conclusion, uh, injury one cod, which represent the majority of the sample size, were relatively unstressed. But when we look at uh, injuries in higher higher injuries besides injury one, 
we uh, see that it evokes a, a primary stress response and also an osmotic regulatory disturbance. And if um, the stress is prolonged or chronic, uh, this may have an impact on the overall fitness, uh, the growth, and reproduction, which is uh, not good for the populations of Atlantic cod. Uh, something I hadn't mentioned was a grad student in my lab is actually uh, working on quantifying post-release mortality uh, through acoustic telemetry. Um, I'm hoping to collaborate with him and uh, using my data and his uh, get a better and clearer picture of how cod interact, interact with uh, lobster gear. With that, I'd like to thank uh, all my lab mates and uh, my advisor, uh, James Lukowski. His uh, advice was invaluable and uh, I'm very grateful for all my lab uh, lab mates because not a lot of people would go out at 6 a.m. and <laughs> slave over the uh, stinky bait barrels. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Ed Hutchins, which is the commercial fisherman that we went out with. Um, he was super helpful in all aspects of the project. And I'd also like to thank Pratt Whitney and uh, the NOAA NIMS uh, Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program for funding me. And with that, I'll take some questions. What did you use in the controls? Uh, so I, we used a, a jig set of uh, uh, cod that were caught on uh, rod and reel. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my study doesn't really focus on that. The uh, the actual we actually collected like 119 over the two years, but that was part of the grad student study. And CQE um, wasn't really something that uh, I looked at just because I was based on I was focusing on stress. Um, but uh, yeah, CQE is highly variable. But in those in, from those months of May to July, that's where we see most of our catch. So it varies. Greatly, like on the time of year. We usually hear about overfishing when it comes to the cod population. How does how does what you're studying compare with overfishing as a as an explanatory factor in why the cod population is so low? So, the reason why we're studying this is because overfishing has already occurred. And now we're trying to figure out all the sources of the, their population decline. So at the beginning, I didn't really mention that, but um, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at all the, the other sources of their population decline. Uh, overfishing has already been looked at. There's already strict management set in place. Um, so, you know, we're starting to look at other factors like climate change and the predator prey interactions and uh, bycatch. He has a major in biochemistry and a minor in both applied mathematics and biological sciences. His advisor is Eva Rose Baylon, and I'm hoping I'm not going to screw up your title, Robert. It's the expression of soluble vascular endothelial growth factor 121 and design of VEGF SH3 fusion proteins. All right. Hey, Robert, would you like to give the talk instead? <laughs> All right. So, as you just said, uh, this summer I worked on expressing a protein called vascular endothelial growth factor 121, and further designing gene sequences for a VEGF SH3 fusion protein. So, first and foremost, cell signaling and ligand extracellular matrix anchorage. So, vascular endothelial growth factor is a master regular of angiogenesis. It's the development of new veins from pre-existing complexes. This is primarily used in therapeutics, for skin grafts, and for burn victims, and so on. As you're putting the skin onto that area, those cells in the skin graft need nutrients. To get nutrients, you need blood vessels. So, they use VEGF to make new veins that bring nutrients to those areas. So, this is already known. Information in this way is carried through concentration, the isoform, the gradient, and the attachment. This last one, attachment, is the one that we're, I am primarily focusing on. So the overall goal is to create an artificial extracellular matrix that allows us to control this anchorage of VEGF to the ECM, mimic natural cell environment factors, and that will allow us to study the downstream effects of 
the attachment of VEGF to the ECM. So artificial extracellular matrices are in no way a new thing. There have been many made, and they primarily fall into two categories. There are biopolymers and synthetics. Biopolymers are things like collagen, matrigels, and elastin-like polymers. Synthetics are such things as PEG and methylcellulose. They have their benefits and their detractments. The biopolymers are all biocompatible, but you don't really have as much control over the exact um, content of them. Collagen, for example, is, from what I gather, basically boiled down from natural sources, and what you get is what you get. And on the flip side, the synthetics, you have more control of attachment of various factors into them, but they're not exactly as biocompatible as other biopolymers like collagen are. Signaling molecule-wise, as you're attaching them, is primarily two ways. You can either permanently attach the signal molecules you want or have them showed control release. So ours is kind of like a marriage of the two of them. We want them to be protein-based, which is biocompatible and so on, but also to have the fine-tuning control of the synthetic polymers, so basically right in the middle ground. Our ACM will be composed of two primary factors, a fusion protein composed of VEGF and another protein called SRC homology 3 domain, or SH3 for short, because who wants to say SRC homology 3 domain every time? But <laughs> SH3 is an awesome protein that shows controllable affinity binding to proline-rich sequences. For example, you have SH3 and then three different peptide sequences right here that show either high medium or low affinity. So that's actually how strong and like how often this molecule will be attached to the ECM. So as, instead of just being free floating, the VEGF, once it's attached to SH3, is either going to show strong attachment to low attachment. So from there, we'll be able to study the downstream effects of how endothelial cells and how vein development responds to basically only having like high attachment or just low attachment or even just free floating if we just throw a plain old VEGF on there. But lastly, and this is the other part of the AACM, which is not quite my domain, but you need to know what it is, the elastin-like polymers are the foundation of this whole artificial extracellular matrix. They are based off of a protein in humans called elastin, which is the shows the elastic-like tendencies of skin and ECM. So by using that and incorporating the variable proline-rich peptide sequences into them, you'll have a basically a cell environment that incorporates the binding sites of SH3 and VEGF. So biocompatible and has the controllable binding sites of a synthetic polymer. So this is our plan. And as this convenient arrow shows, that's where I am right now. So first and foremost, and what we did this summer, is we expressed and purified just regular VEGF. Then from there, we designed and cloned the VEGF SH3 fusion protein. And that's where we are. From there, we'll then express and purify said fusion protein. And then we have to ensure that both parts of the fusion protein are folded correctly. Because if they just turn into some snarled mess of amino acids, it's useless to us. It won't bind to their proline sequences, and the signaling of the VEGF is just be non-existent, and it'd be useless, and I'll have done nothing, and my life will mean nothing. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> on a more positive note, and once, once they're properly folded, we then optimize the conditions for the expression and purification, because we don't want to make just like a few milligrams of it. We want to make a lot of it to do a lot of experiments. So, for expressing and purifying VEGF, VEGF has never been purified in the Balog lab before, so I had some room to play around with conditions and experiments. That's what I did. So, we wanted to test for the solubility and the quantity of the protein. It needs to be easily accessible and we need to make a lot of it. To do this, we tested two variables, the types of bacterial cells we used and the type of media we used. So, Bacterial cell-wise, we chose two BL21 cells, which are general workhorse bacteria. They make a lot of protein, and they do it well. And then we chose um, a strain called Shuffle, which are genetically engineered to full disulfide-bonded proteins, of which VEGF is one of them. Media-wise, we chose 2XYT, which is a regular, just general lab media, 
And we then chose a glycerol-based media based on past literature that had expressed VEGF using glycerol-based media as opposed to regular glucose. And so these are those results. And there, at the moment, there are two types of people right here. There are those who have never done Western blots before who are thinking, oh, wow, look at that. It's like green fluorescence must be really cool. And then there are those of you who have done Western blots who are cringing and thinking, ugh, I wouldn't put that in a paper. <laughs> be kind. This was my first Western blot. It shows. Um, <laughs> so this arrow right here, pointing on that little snarl mess, is the soluble proteins of the sh only in the shuffle cells. BL21 cells only made VEGF in the insoluble fractions. So insoluble fractions are inclusion bodies. You can get protein from inclusion bodies, but it takes more work, and we just want to be efficient and take the easy route, which we did. So we chose the shuffle cells and the 2XY media, 2XYT media that made soluble VEGF. So that's what we did. We then purified, or made a larger scale of that, and then purified the protein, ran it on gel electrophoresis, and it showed up exactly where it should have been, thankfully. It means it's not cleaved, and it's not basically a snarled mess of anything. So basically, my summer was validated. I actually did something this summer. <laughs> Yay. I didn't just waste money. So the next step is to design the fusion protein. This is actually a lot easier than anything else. What we're basically doing is taking the genetic sequences of VEGF and SH3 and basically putting them right next to each other, such that when the bacteria start expressing this gene sequence and folding the protein, it will make one of them and then seamlessly transition into the next. And pres presuming everything goes well, they'll fold each gene sequence will fold properly into either the SH3 or the VEGF domain. And hopefully both will have the activity they deserve. What we do focus on is a linker sequence that goes in between the SH3 and the VEGF. Because you don't want to necessarily put both domains right next to each other. That doesn't really give them room to fold and doesn't give them room to flex around as they're doing their normal thing. So we put basically this linker sequence, which basically does nothing. It's just like a tether between the two domains. It's like a platypus. It doesn't really do much. I'm glad people laughed at that one. Okay. So, Linker sequence needs to be flexible, allow the two domains to flex around, and nonpolar, so it doesn't interact with the aqueous environment or anything. It just connects the two of them. Next, this is, so expressed protein are in the form of a plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA that we put into bacterial cells and then we induce them. To incorporate the SH3 gene sequence into our VEGF plasmid, we need to first linearize the VEGF plasmid on either side. Once on the five side, five prime side of VEGF, and once on the right side. This makes a linear linear form of the plasmid that allows us to use a technique called circular polymerase chain reaction, that allows us to incorporate a nucleotide sequence of SH3, which you, and the linker sequence, which you can't quite see because it's not that big, but at any rate, put them together, put some polymerase on there, and it will form a new circular piece of DNA that incorporates the SH3 linker sequence and the VEGF. And so I mentioned earlier that we're going to do this twice, once on the five prime end, and then another set of experiments on the three prime end. We want to do this because we don't, we haven't seen any tests on whether putting the fusion protein, the other half of the fusion protein on either end actually affects the folding because the structure matters in proteins. If it's not folded correctly, if it can't fold correctly, it's utterly useless to us. It's just a construct of amino acids that does nothing. So we want to see if putting the SH3 on either the 5 prime or the 3 prime allows it to fold better and maintain more of the native function. And that's where we are right now. A lot of DNA, copy and pasting. So, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Eva Balog, who puts up with me, the rest of my lab mates, who also put up with me, um, and the University of New England for doing the summer research program. It was a great opportunity. So, any questions? <laughs> any questions? Ah, that's what I mean.
Do you have a prediction of which one you think will work better in cloud front and free front? Um, yes, I have looked at the uh, PyMall structures of VEGF and seen like how it folds in particular, and my little opinion that has no real backing except for that is that the one with the SA3 on the five prime end will fold a little better because that end of the VEGF is actually like kind of sticking out on the surface. So it's not like buried inside of the protein or whatever, which could be a problem. If both ends of the protein are like buried in the hydrophobic core, I literally don't know how you would get around putting anything on there because any linker sequence in there would distort the structure and maybe ruin the active site and lose all signaling capability. Um, largely we chose the amino acid sequences that weren't nonpolar, so glycine and cysteine and so on. That's lar largely what it was, was repeats of that. So basically their residues didn't have any um, hydrophobic or hydrophilic activity. They were just there and there weren't any hindrances to it. It's allowed to flex around. There weren't really prolines that have specific um, hindrance to their flexibility. So literally, uh, there are some people that have done linker sequences that were just like randomly selected non-reactive non residues. This one was actually, the one that we choose is actually a modified um, design from a previous literature. Wasn't working with VEGF or SH3, but it worked for him. So hopefully we don't have to do more experiments with different linker sequences. <coughs> doing the uh, assays. Um, one of my lab partners, Lisa, is actually doing tests with SH3 itself and it's binding to these um, peptide sequences using tryptophan fluorescence. So largely that's what we do as well um, in the future, which we haven't really thought about, but I, what I conceptually think we do is that I would make this protein and then I would give it to her or maybe do it myself and we do the same thing use for the SH3 and then for the VEGF um, a number of ways we could do it. We could do the same thing, get um, VEGF receptors and do similar fluorescence assays, or even just test their um, response on endothelial cells in comparison to just regular VEGF. So if they react the same, it's a safe bet to say it's folded the same, or there's some fundamental flaw in my understanding of biochemistry, which I think there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our next speaker is Lars Hammer, who is majors in marine biology, and he also has a minor in applied mathematics. That's, that's three in a row. His advisor <laughs> is James Wolkowski, and he's going to talk to us about the importance of the Saco River estuary to winter flounder. Actually, so. You want to pronounce that scientific name? No. <laughs> so it's Pseudochloronectus americanus for those who are curious. And thank you all for coming, by the way. This is uh, research that I've conducted towards my honors thesis um, under Dr. James Sulikowski. So why am I interested in winter flounder? Well, first of all, winter flounder are fish, and fish are super cool. <laughs> Secondly, winter flounder is an economically important resource. And lastly, and most importantly, uh, winter flounder are currently facing the impacts of heavy fishing pressures, as well as climate change and other factors. This here is the Southern New England stock assessment for uh, 1981 through to, uh, 2014. And as you can see, it's really not looking good. Luckily, however, strict management has temporarily stabilized populations, and some have even seen slight increases. However, uh, that is not the only factor that needs to be considered in terms of management. Another factor is uh, studying and protecting essential fish habitats. So estuaries provide exemplary habitat for uh, young fish. 
And for flounder specifically, these are areas that have sandy substrates, low current speeds, and ideal temperatures of around 4 to 7 degrees Celsius in the spring and 10 to 15 degrees Celsius in the fall. These areas support key life history stages, and in some cases, all life history stages can be supported from the egg all the way up to the adult. These areas are called nurseries. So here is a map of the current nursery grounds for winter flounder, and as you can see, the majority of them are located from New Hampshire south. Now, the ocean is warming. Global temperatures are expected to increase between 1.1 and 6.4 degrees Celsius by 2100. And the Gulf of Maine in particular is warming at alarming rates. So here we have the Gulf of Maine in red here, which corresponds to about 0.2 degrees Celsius uh, of warming per year, which is very significant. <clears throat> and winter flounder have been shown to be very vulnerable to warming. Uh, temperatures of above 27 degrees Celsius can be fatal to them. So this figure is from a study done by Hare et al. in 2016 showing biological sensitivity on the y-axis and climate exposure on the x. And here we can see the winter flounder, again in that red zone, corresponding to a high biological sensitivity and a very high climate exposure to warming. So fish can respond to climate change in multiple different ways. One way could be decreased reproductive success. So an already decreased population could be further harmed by the effects of global warming. Another is fish biomass moving northward. So many different species have been both predicted and observed to move northward in response to climate change, including the winter flounder. Now, if this is the case here, these northern nursery grounds are going to be of increased importance in the coming years. However, they're also the most understudied at this point. The Saka River estuary is one of these northern nurseries. It's, part, it's the fourth longest river in Maine, originating in the White Mountains outlined by the Red Star and emptying into Saco Bay outlined by the red box. Here is a close-up of the river from the Cataract Dam in Saco out to Saco Bay. And here is the original study site. The red indicates the marine component and the green represents the estuarine component. So this area is really interesting because there's really not much known about it. Only three previous studies have looked at fish communities in the area. The first being Reynolds and Castellan in, in 1985, who observed fish habitat distributions. So essentially, they fished for different species and figured out where each one was prevalent. The next was Wargo et al. in 2009, who observed the larval stage of winter flounder. And finally, Fury and Solikowski in 2011, who observed various commercially valuable species as well as species of concern. These include the Atlantic sturgeon, rainbow smelt, uh, blueback herring, bluefish, and you guessed it, the winter flounder. <laughs> Fury and Sulikowski also suggested that this area could serve as a nursery ground for juvenile fish species. So due to the importance of winter flounder and their vulnerability to climate change, I decided to start a directed study uh, to see how important this area is for them. So to do this, I asked two questions. How and to what extent is the Saka River being utilized by winter flounder? So what are they using the area for? And are there any separations of habitat preference based on life stage? And secondly, are multiple year classes supported in the area? So are we seeing everything from the young of the year all the way up to the adult? So to look at these questions, sampling began in May of 2016. <clears throat> Here at Freddy Beach, beach sanding was conducted, which is essentially dragging the net parallel to the shoreline in this fashion. Um, beach sanding occurred twice a week, and we used a net with a 7 millimeter mesh that was 14 meters long and 1.5 and meters high. Here in Biddeford Pool, otter trawling was conducted. This happened once a week, and the net that we used was 25 feet long with a 4 centimeter mesh right here and then a 2 centimeter caught end mesh there in the back. So for every fish collected, uh, total length and, mate, and weight were measured, and a water sample was analyzed using a YSI, which gave us temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and pH, which are all important in determining the overall health of the environment. Additionally, each fish was tagged in one of three methods, the first being uh, pit tagging, or passive integrated transponder tagging, alpha tagging, or pectoral fin clipping. So some general data for that part of the study. 80 total flounder were captured in 2016. 
uh, 63 of which were tagged in one of those methods, and 17 were fin clipped. The size range of the study was from 20 millimeters to 400 millimeters. So to put that to scale, this guy's about 120 millimeters, which is about the size of my hand. So some preliminary staining results. Uh, we have the total length in millimeters on the y-axis and month captured on the x for 2013, 14, and 16 in blue and 2015 in green. So here in May and June, we have uh, likely year one individuals that may have overwintered inside the estuary. However, by July, we see that they're gone from the system. And instead, we see the young of the year coming into the area. And we can see over time that they grow up inside the area. Here are some trawling results. Again, average total length in millimeters on the Y and month captured on the X. The main thing to note here is that all of these individuals, or the majority of them, are a lot bigger than those caught in the seine. So this means we have a separation of habitat preference, and the, the young of the year seem to be preferring Freddy Beach, while the older individuals prefer Bitterford Pool. So preliminary results thus far suggest that this is an important area for all life history stages, not just one, and that there appears to be a separation of habitat preference. So to put this together, I kind of made a quick infographic. So in February and June, these are the year ones that stayed over in the estuary. They're also out in Bitterford Pool. During this time, the adults fly in pretty quick. <laughs> and they spawn, they pop out an egg. And then by July, the young of the year are headed into the estuary and the adults into Bitterford Pool. Into August and September, the young of the year grow up inside the estuary. And then by October, everything seems to leave. So now we know that it is in fact important for all life history stages, but how exactly are these flounder using the river? So in order to look at this question, a new tagging method was uh, introduced this past summer. So 17 uh, juvenile winter flounder from 12 centimeters to 18 centimeters were tagged with acoustic transmitters, as you can see on uh, the back here. And hopefully this video works. This is just a quick video of a flounder release. You can see the tag on his back there. It looks pretty big compared to the size of the fish. <clears throat> so these flounder were monitored with a uh, 10 receiver acoustic array in and out of the river. Um, and the way that these, this animation might be funky, there's a lot going on here. But the way this works is as the fish passes by the receiver, yeah, it's not working, um, it sends out a a ping to the receiver, and that information uh, is stored on the receiver for future download. I like my an animations a lot, so <laughs> you know you never know if it's going to work or not. <clears throat> Additionally, active tracking was utilized to find if there were any gaps in between uh, receivers. So when one of these two hydrophones was attached to the VR100 deck box, it kind of worked as a mobile receiver, allowing us to track up and down the river. Uh, to find fish. So here is some uh, preliminary detection data. The circles represent the location of receivers in and out of the river, and the size of the circles is representative of the number of detections. Now you can't see it here, but there is in fact one detection up here by the dam at uh, the, the most um, upriver receiver. Now to take us back to this original picture, this is what we thought flounder were utilizing in the river. However, it seems to be, in fact, all of the usable, usable river below the dam, which is pretty interesting. Here's just another uh, way we can look at some of this data. So this flounder was released on August 1st. And at August 14th, at 1142, he swims over to this receiver. At 528, he swims down here. 1117, he's back up there. 854, he's here. Nine, he's back there. <laughs> And at 7.30 a.m., he's here. This flounder is accompanied with a nice-looking surfboard. <laughs> That's because he actually seems to be following the tide up the river, which is interesting because we've seen this happen in other species, such as the yellowtail flounder. So released on the 17th, the 18th at 1.59, he's up there, continues up the river, further up there at 3.22, 3.45, and finally at 4.16. Now this flounder kind of combines those two movements. He it was released at, on the 31st, 
goes outside, 7.35 a.m., 11.52 p.m. on the 19th, 12.08 p.m. on the 20th, uh, 8.50 on the 21st, and then he magically turns around and seems to follow the tide back into the river. So he's 8.06 a.m., he's here, 8.31, he's here, 9.05, 9.22, and finally 11.27. Now after he gets here, he kind of uh, moves back and forth between these three receivers for a few days. And I know I already put a lot of movement in here, so I didn't want to bore you with any more. <clears throat> so what's really important to realize is these are not large, mobile fish. They're actually very small, as you can see here. And it's pretty interesting that they're making these large-scale movements during the day. So in the future, I will be continuing to monitor uh, flounder movements throughout October until their tag life uh, dies. I will be incorporating abiotic data into my um, analyses to try and find any trends in their movements. And I will be, in the end, I will be putting this all together for an honors thesis and eventually a publication before I graduate. I would like to thank the entire Sulikowski lab, uh, especially Brett Sweezy um, and also Tim Arianti, who were very helpful in driving the boat for all of my research trips. And I would also like to thank uh, the Shura Committee for funding this research in 2017 as well as 2016. And I'll take any questions. Yeah. Have you thought about how the size of the acoustic tags might affect the fish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, um, so there's, in general, there's a, I believe it's, 10% of the overall body weight is the maximum weight of, that the tag should be. And we were close to that. Some of them might have been a little bit over the 10%, but um, we did uh, actually keep the flounder in the lab for a few days, and they seemed to be moving around fine. Um, no real issues. They, they seem to act normally in lab, so you know there could be something, but we didn't really notice anything. Did you observe any mortality in the yeah, so we did, uh, there were two individuals um, that have not moved since uh, release. Um, they, you know, they could be alive, but it's likely that they are dead because they haven't moved. So there has been a little, there has been a little mortality, but not very significant. Yeah. Is there any chance that those two fish that are making the large scale movements are just kind of eaten by a striper? Or yeah, or you know, it's, it's definitely, um, definitely a possibility. There's no real way of knowing. Um, but it's also, like I said, other species have been observed to move up with the tide like that. So it's, it's like not the salt exactly. Yeah. So it's not anything. It's not anything crazy to think that. Yeah, it's, still it's, on. Uh, it's about 132 days. So it should be done in the next few weeks here. Uh, so fin clipping was for the individuals that were too small to tag with any of the other methods. Um, so it was basically, you know, we were getting it was we were getting these really small flounder like this big, and we never really seen them before. So we wanted to be able to track them somehow. So fin clipping was just a way to identify if we captured them before, um, other than tagging, because tagging may have been too painful for the little guys. Yeah, we also kind of assessed that in the lab. Um, I went through a bunch of revisions in my procedure. Uh, the first time I tagged it a little too close to the side of its body, and it came, the tag just like came right out. So that was definitely not the best approach, but I finally came to a, a good design that um, has, I mean, we're seeing movements that would be characteristic of uh, a fish moving. So I believe they have been working well. So our next speaker is Katherine Parker. She's also a marine biologist. Her advisors are Carrie Byron and Adam St. Gillet. And she's going to talk about a histopathological survey of pathogens formed in farms, blue mussels, are middleus edulis, Lars. 
Yeah, it's a little bit many. That one I studied. <laughs> All right, um, so these are the results from the work that I did over the summer, which was reviewing parasites and pathogens in a farm blue mussel population. Um, so a little background, um, the blue mussel is a marine bivalve that's commonly found in the northeastern United States in the Rocky Intertidal. Um, mussel farms are able to utilize the natural environment of these organisms um, to sustainably grow a high quality protein source. They do go on the market for about $8 per pound. Um, and it's estimated that about 4 million pounds of blue mussels, which is amounting to about $10 million, uh, was harvested in 2014, with 85% of that coming from the Gulf of Maine. Um, unfortunately, from 2004 to 2013, the Gulf of Maine has been warming at a faster rate than 99.9% .9 of the world's oceans. And so this changing environment is creating a um, certain physiological disruptions, whether this be changes in weather patterns, ocean acidification, or the introduction of new species. Um, and so we've been seeing an alarming decline in wild blue mussel populations due to these environmental changes. So it's been documented that um, looking back from the 1970s, their wild populations have decreased by about 60%. And uh, more locally, in the summer of 2016, a mussel farm experienced an out-of-season spawning followed by a mass die-off. So this is leaving mussel farmers to ask the question, how is climate change going to impact the future of uh, mussel aquaculture. And so in order to do this, uh, my team and myself, uh, we're looking at the reproductive and storage tissues, histopathology, and lipid and stable isotope analysis of these mussels. And so reproductive and storage tissues, looking at those can determine when the highest meat yields will occur, um, determining how storage and reproductive tissues fluctuate throughout the year, so um, you can look at that as well. The lipid and stable isotope analysis, so looking at lipids will use fatty acid signatures to determine the energy storage of the mussels, um, and then use, looking at that stable isotope isotope can determine the mussels' trophic interactions with their environment. Um, but the main focus of this research was to just look at the histopathology of the mussels. So this is determining what parasites and pathogens are present in the mussels and their impact on the future health of the mussels. So over um, a six-month sampling period from February to August of 2017, five mussels of submarket size were randomly selected um, from two rafts, one of them being um, off of Clapboard Island, which is an inshore site, and one of them being off of Bangs Island, which is an offshore site. And so this is a little about uh, what the mussel farms look like. And so they're basically floating out on these rafts, and they have these wood beams across them. And you'll see um, there's the ropes on there too, and so the mussels grow on these 30-foot lines, and then when they're ready, when they're at the correct size, the ropes are brought out of the water, and that's how they're harvested. So for the processing of the samples, um, the mussels were shucked, weighed, and placed in a 10% Z-fixative solution for 24 hours. Um, that Z-fixative works to solidify and preserve the tissues, and then after that 24-hour period, they were rinsed and stored in ethanol um, until they were ready for histological processing. And so for those of you that don't know, histology is a useful technique that's used to look at tissues at a cellular level. And so this involved embedding the tissue in a paraffin wax block and then sectioning it every 1,000 microns, um, which would then produce these five micron sections of tissue that were mounted onto slides and stained. And then the tissue is stained with hematoxylin and eosin. Hematoxylin is a purple stain that has an affinity for genetic material, and eosin is a pink stain that has an affinity for proteins. Um, and then histopathology is then using these samples to identify changes in the tissues caused by the pathogens and parasites. And so this photo in the bottom left here is what those um, five micron thick tissue samples look like after they've been mounted and stained on the slide. So each muscle produced five histological slides from the anterior portion of their tissue. And so two slides from each of these muscles was used for survey. And so in order to quantify these parasites, they were either counted individually or put on a zero to four scale, with zero showing no sign of infection and four showing that over three-fourths of the tissue is demonstrating um, the infection. And so from this, uh, prevalence and intensity values were calculated to then um, determine the infection severity and compare it between the two sites. So prevalence is found by taking the sum of the hosts with the parasite or pathology and dividing it by the number of hosts analyzed and multiplying that by 100, so you get a percentage. And then intensity is taking the sum of the number of occurrences of a parasite or pathology and dividing that by the number of hosts with that um, parasite or pathology. Um, and that will give you kind of a wide range of these values. So you use that formula at the bottom, which is then used to put those intensity scales um, on a scale of 0 to 100. So the histopathological parameters that are surveyed for um, was oocytotresia, which is the degeneration of eggs within the female gonad. 
Um, hemocyte-filled mantle, mantle follicles, which are basically these lesions that will form in the mantle tissue that get filled with hemocytes, which is similar to the human white blood cell. Um, unknown ciliates, which are these single-celled organisms that will attach themselves, um, they contain cilia and they will attach themselves to the gill lamellae. Eosinophilic clusters are these groupings of um, these stained bodies that would die with that eosin dye, um, and they are found within the gills and digestive tissue. Digestive gland atrophy, which is the degeneration of digestive tissue, and then trematode presence. So trematodes are parasitic flatworms um, that will utilize muscles as hosts for certain life stages. One of these trematodes uh, specifically is Protoceus megalatus, and this is a subtropical parasitic trematode that has a wide host tolerance for all of its life stages. And so this uh, particular trematode is an issue because its species range is expanding as the Gulf of Maine is warming. And so it's been documented as far north as Dover, New Hampshire. Um, and this movement of this trematode is an issue because infections can negatively impact growth, um, energy storage, and circulatory systems and result potentially in mass die-offs of muscle populations. So this is the overall prevalence um, of those histopathological parameters. And so bangs is in blue and clapboard is in orange. Um, the most significant finding from this is that oocyte atresia, the degeneration of the oocytes, was found in all of the females at Bangs Island, and only uh, most of the females at Clapboard, only like one or two, did not show signs of that oocyte atresia. Um, and so overall, what's very interesting about this data is that if you look at the parameters that are in those red boxes, those are not necessarily parasites or pathogens, but they're a response from the body to some sort of physiological stress. And so what we're seeing here um, is differential statistics have not yet been performed between the two sites um, to determine if they are stati statistically different from each other. But we are seeing a presence of those um, kind of responses at the same sites and they're in similar prevalences. If you look at specific parasites, such as like the trematodes or the unknown ciliates, those are very site-specific. Um, and so that's kind of leading to believe that these parasites and pathogen infections are more site-specific while there is some sort of environmental stress potentially happening at both of these sites altogether. So this is um, the intensity data. These are just the scaled factors. These are the ones that were quantified on that zero to four scale. The ciliates, um, hemocyte mantle follicles, and trematodes could not be put into the scale because it wouldn't work um, correctly mathematically, but they did have low intensities. Um, and so the highest intensity um, found overall was that oocyte atresia, again, followed by those eosinophilic clusters and the digestive gland atrophy. Um, so these are those intensity values broken down per month. And so the biggest takeaway from this is looking at that blue line on the um, intensity of scale factors at Bangs Island. That is the oocyte atresia. And um, from my understanding, it's reflecting the reproductive cycles of the females. And so you'll see it increasing throughout the summer and then kind of dropping off around June and July. And so the females are making all these oocytes, they're making their, os um, their eggs, and then they spawn. And so you see that drop off because there's going to be less oocytes within the mantle. Um, and it is noted there is no um, data on the oocyte atresia from August at Bangs Island or May at Clapboard Island because from those five muscles that were sampled, none of them ended up being female. Um, so overall, oocyte atresia was the most prevalent and intense pathological factor identified in the muscle samples. And so currently the known causes for this is unfavorable spawning conditions. So that means that um, the muscles don't feel that the environment is correct for them to release their oocytes, so they're going to kind of break them down and restart from there. Uh, malnutrition, so if there's not a lot of food in the water and they've used up their energy storages, um, the females are then going to start breaking down their eggs and trying to regain those um, lipids and fatty acids to get nutrients. And then also it's been noted that exposure to pollutants such as crude oil um, could also cause this response. And so that means that maybe some sort of hormonal disruption is occurring in the water. And so this potentially could be affecting the reproductive success of the muscles um, because if less oocytes are being put into the water, there's less chance of creating more muscles. Um, and it's also an ind indication that there may be some sort of environmental concern happening out in the water. So digestive gland atrophy was prevalent at both sites, um, especially during the summer months. And so it had low calculated intensity throughout the survey, and there are no severe cases identified. And so looking at the photo, um, the black arrow is pointed to a healthier tissue that's a bit thicker, and the red arrow is pointing to an unhealthy tissue, so it's got that thin lining, it's been degenerated. And so digestive gland atrophy is noted to be a common occurrence um, that's usually associated with environmental stressors similar to that oocyte atresia. So looking at poor nutrition or exposure to certain environmental contaminants. 
Um, the gill ciliates, those were identified at low intensity throughout the study and none were identified at the clapboard site, but cilia infections are often found to be very site specific um, at low intensities. So this means that um, the bang site may just be a more favorable environment for the ciliates to survive in. Those eosinophilic clusters um, that I found, they were found within the gills and the digestive tissue. They're currently believed to be some sort of sporocyte infection or an immune response, but that's not confirmed. Um, so I did see these in a portion of the muscles, but when looking at the literature, there's not a lot that looks similar to this. Um, so they were found at low prevalence and intensity in digestive systems and low intensity in the gills, but it's unclear on their impact to the muscle's health because I don't exactly know what they are. <laughs> Um, so trematode infections, those were only identified in two females from the August, in August at the clapboard site, and this does pose a threat to the future health of the muscles um, because severe infections can result in castration, um, negatively impacted growth in locomotion, or even death of the muscle. So continuing to analyze uh, more samples for um, looking for trematodes um, can, and potentially determining the species could figure out the future health on the muscles. And then also hopefully using DNA gene sequencing, gene sequencing on the muscles um, would be able to determine if this trematode is that Pertesius mechalatus that we've been seeing moving northward. So in conclusion, um, the identified parasites, um, they're in low enough intensity or prevalence that they don't seem to be a serious threat uh, to the overall health of the muscles. Um, what the really significant finding is, is that prevalence of those histopathological stress responses um, in similar values at both sites, um, rather than the parasites being mostly self um, site specific, indicates that there may be some sort of environmental stress in the water that is affecting both of the sites. Um, and the most concerning finding is that highly prevalent oocyte atresia along with that digestive gland atrophy. So further sampling and analysis is needed to determine the cause and impact of that. Um, and there's still the present threat of that migrating trematode species, Protosius mechalatus, so continuing to look at the muscle, spe muscle samples in the water to see if it's come this far north. Um, and also, um, the addition of recorded environmental conditions and environmental data at the muscle farm will be, uh, once that's added to the data set, will be able to give a better understanding of how environmentally different, um, based off of like temperature and salinity, these two sites are. So I'd really like to thank um, Peter Cardona and the University of New England Histology and Imaging Corps facility for teaching me the process of histology um, and letting me use their facilities. I would really like to thank CNET as well as the University of New England Marine Science Center for their support of my research. Um, and I'd also really like to thank my advisors, Carrie Byron and Adam St. Gillet, uh, for their support and guidance of my research. Biomaterial, fusion of elastin like polymers with a lobster carapace carotenoid protein. Hi, so I've only been introduced, but 
Today, I'm going to be talking about some new uh, functions and applications of a novel uh, protein-based biomaterial. So proteins have many unique characteristics which differ between one protein and the next. And these characteristics can be exploited and then engineered to be made and used as a protein-based biomaterial. The advantages of using proteins in this regard are, one, biocompatibility. This allows us to use these proteins with biological systems and not cause harm while using them. The second is the control of composition. Like I said, these materials we're working with are genetically engineered. So we dictate how they're made and we control how sensitive they are to different stimuli. And the third is biodegradability. This allows us to use these materials and to dispose of them in a way which is sustainable. The current problems we're facing in implementing these type of materials are, first, durability. When proteins are in the body, they're constantly being broken down or remade. And when we take proteins out of the body, we lose this function. And the second is scalability. Right now, it's still difficult to be able to synthesize a large concentration of these protein materials. And being able to do so will allow us to further study how they're made and to find new applications of how to use them. So I work with two proteins, the first of which being elastin-like polymers, or ELPs. ELPs are genetically engineered protein polymers derived from the connective tissue protein elastin. These protein polymers are made up of many valine, proline, and glycine residues. And these amino acid residues are assembled into repeating monomeric units of five amino acids sequence, valine, proline, glycine, a guest residue, and then another glycine. This guest residue can be any amino acid, and depending on which amino acid is present at that location, will dictate how sensitive it is to different stimuli. And this protein is important to us because it exhibits conformational change due to changes in its environment, such as that in temperature, pH, and salinity. And in my experiments, I vary the temperature to induce that conformational change. So essentially, I either increase temperature or decrease the temperature to a threshold called the transition temperature, at which point, over the transition temperature, the protein will be in a condensed aggregated state and insoluble in water. And above that temperature, it will be in a free-floating soluble state. And that's what's shown in this picture right here. And when this protein goes into that aggregated state, it expels water from the system to hide as hydrophobic pockets. The second protein I work with is crustacyanin. This is a carotenoprotein found naturally in the car pieces of lobsters. This protein will exhibit a specific color depending on whether it's bound or just associated with a pigment molecule known as a carotenoid. Each carotenoprotein is associated with a specific carotenoid, and for crustacyanin, that carotenoid molecule is astaxanthin. And depending on whether crustacyanin is bound or just associated with astaxanthin will result in for this protein and pigment molecule complex, either a blue or red color. And that's the color change you see when you cook a lobster. When a lobster is alive, naturally, the protein is interacting with the pigment molecule, the astaxanthin. And when the lobster is cooked, the protein denatures. And that results in the color change you see from blue to red. As for the structure of crustacyanin, it's a protein composed of eight subunits. And each of those subunits is made up of two smaller subunits called CRTA and CRTC. These smaller subunits are the actual components of the protein which bind the astaxanthin molecules and propagate that color change. This protein is important to us because it's been shown previously that in the presence of astaxanthin, so when bound to astaxanthin throughout, it produces reversible color change due to a dehydration in its environment. So essentially what that means is when water is removed from that environment, it will change colors and can then be reinverted back to the original color by reintroducing water to the system. And unlike in the natural protein where the color change is induced by a denaturation of the protein from the pigment molecule, in this case, the color change is due to dehydration and must occur in the presence of astaxanthin when the protein is constantly bound to the astaxanthin molecule throughout. Knowing how these two proteins uh, function, we're looking to accomplish two goals. The first of which being to induce that reversible color chain across the cyanin, but this time through the mechanism of ELP. We're hoping that if we fuse the ELP to across the cyanin, the 
aggregating mechanism of BLP and the expulsion of water from its system will dehydrate the environment around crustacea and produce a reversible color change. Notice in the same way when dehydrating crustacea directly. And the second goal we're trying to accomplish is to improve the soluble, soluble expression and the synthesis of crustacea. It's been shown that using ELPs as a fusion tag has increased the synthesis of different proteins, and we're hoping that this is also the case for crustacea. The key to accomplishing both these goals is to synthesize and design a crustacea ELP fusion protein. To do that, I need to design a plasma which encodes both the ELP and in our case that's an insert inside of a vector containing the crustacea gene. And for that, I need to pick an insert in plasma, I mean, I'm sorry, pick an insert in vector which I want to clone and then later synthesize. And that's the first thing I did when I came in the summer. So I began doing my research this summer and I picked up from the work of a previous student in the blog lab, Chris Glover. And what I want to do is find out what work he's been able to accomplish and what proteins he's been able to synthesize and express. And I came upon this image. This is a protein gel which Chris ran. And in this protein gel, he ran the two subunits of crustacean, both CRTA and CRTC. And it shows which, pro which subunit he was able to express and whether that expression was seen in the insoluble or soluble fractions. As you can see, he was able to express the CRTA subunit and not the CRTC. And that expression was seen and localized in the insoluble fraction. The fact that the expression that was seen was localized in the insoluble fraction is not necessarily ideal. It means that when the protein was synthesized, there was some type of protein misfolding. And it would require us to go in later on and refold and reshape the protein. But the fact that he saw expression at all for this subunit opposed to other made me decide to choose this to go ahead and synthesize. Next, I had to choose an ELP. We make ELPs in our lab, so I had a large library which I could have chosen from. And for this protein, I wanted to choose one which I could easily cycle between its soluble and insoluble states. For that, I need to choose one with the transition temperature in an intermediate range so that in my experiments, I wouldn't have to go to a very high or very low temperature to induce that conformational change in ELP. To do this, I need to know the properties and what causes, what causes the uh, transition temperature to be different in ELP. So I know that the longer the ELP, the lower the transition temperature. And opposing that fact, the more polar the ELP, the higher the transition temperature. And these opposing effects is what I was looking for to try to find an ELP with the transition temperature somewhere in the intermediate range. So that being said, I decided to pick the V90 ELP. And as you can see from the image on the top right here, the V90 is the longer of the two ELPs I could have chosen from. And it's also the more polar of the two ELPs I could pick from. And these counteracting factors allowed me to pick an ELP which had a transition temperature I could easily work with. Once, now that I've chosen which proteins I want to synthesize, I need to assemble the DNA which encode these proteins into a plasmid. To do that, I need to create primers which are attached to the ends of the insert on either side so that they have regions of complementarity to both the vector and the insert. I'm sorry, the vector and the gene of interest, so the crustacean gene. And once these regions of overhang are assembled, a polymerase is used to extend that and to create a new plasmid containing both the genes of the ELP and that of crustacean. This is done using a process known as CPEC or circular polymerase extension cloning. CPEC is a new, more efficient way to clone recombinant DNA. And in this process, the first step, what I need to do is linearize a vector containing the crustacean gene using a PCR. After I do that, I need to amplify the insert, the ELP, once again using PCR, and then to add regions of overhang primers to either end of the ELP. Once these overhanging regions of primers are added, I design them in a way so one region of overhang complements that of the vector, and the other side of the insert that regions of overhang is complementing the 
gene of interest, the uh, crest cyanin gene, so that these two overlapping regions can be extended and a new plasmic, be, uh, a new plasmic can be created so that the ELP gene and the crust cyanin gene are in subsequent order and a fusion protein of the two can be created. And that's essentially what I've been working towards step by step this summer. So far, I've been able to linearize a vector to contain the crust cyanin gene. To do that, I need to find the optimal PCR conditions to be able to get good amplification. And that's what's shown in the top image here. This is a DNA gel I ran, and in this DNA gel, I ran 10 microliter samples of the CRTA subunit, and each 10 microliter sample is run at a different PCR condition temperature, ranging from 56 degrees to 64. As you can see, I, saw, I got three signals of amplification at the 56, 58, and 62 degree PCR conditions. Since 62 is the highest temperature at which I got a good signal, I decided to use these parameters and go ahead and scale our production. And that's what's shown in this bottom image. This is another DNA gel which I ran in. In this DNA gel, the parameters were the same as when I got a signal in the last one at the 62 degree condition. As you can see, I still got a signal at the 10 microliter sample, but I did not this time for the 25 and 50. This tells me that there was some type of parameter which I need to change to be able to get a good signal in PCR for the higher volumes which I ran at 25 and 50 microliters. And these type of issues in PCR are normal. It just takes some time to troubleshoot and find out the right conditions to be able to get a good signal. As for ELPs, I haven't been able to get good amplification of this gene as of right now. ELPs are more difficult to clone for two reasons. One, as I said before, ELPs consist of many repeating monomeric units, and this repetitiveness makes the genome of ELPs more unstable and would result in a more difficult cloning procedure. And the second is a high GC content. GC base pairs are more unstable because of their chemical makeup. And the high concentration of GC base pairs in the ELPs causes the genome to be more unstable and therefore more difficult to clone. Once we're able to clone each of these individual components, I'm going to assemble them into a plasmid and then get that plasmid verified to make sure it actually encodes the genes which would give me the protein of my interest. So once I get the verification that the plasma I created encodes for the crust cyanate ELP fusion protein, I then test expression and get the synthesis of the protein, in which case I'll be able to test my hypothesis and hopefully confirm it. Lastly, I want to thank my co-workers in the Belog Lab, the National Science Foundation for providing the funding for my research, Michelle Chianchi and the Los Alamos National Laboratory for providing many of the reagents I use. Thank you. Any questions? That's all. Um, so what are the kinds of applications that you and Dr. Balog envision for using this construct in the future? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, ELPs right now, they're mechanism, they could um, they produce confirmational change due to uh, like different stimuli. So like you could put a tag out to EL ELPs, for example like a calcium tag or like a cut module interceptor and binding a calcium to an ELP in that sense would cause to aggregate. So say we attach a cut module tag to ELP and on the other end there's a cross cyan. That aggregation of ELP can be reported as an optical like a we have optical report by cross and it will provide us with an easy way to tell whether we have a normal amount of calcium. So we take like blood and we have a system where we administer blood to a bunch of ELPs tagged with the uh, calcium receptors and the uh, cross sign on the other end. And depending on the presence of calcium in the blood, there will be an uh, optical response that you'd be able to visually see. Future acid. Yes, yes. Patent that, right? Okay. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay. 
So I, uh, that concludes the Summer Undergraduate Research Experience Symposium. Thank all of you for staying and listening to these talks, and thank you for the presenters that these were, you know, I, I hope that, you know, we were able to show the breadth of the different things that we were, do, that we were able to do here over the summer. And also, I am continually impressed with the amount of work that goes into these. And, you know, I want to tell you presenters that these sound like the beginning of graduate theses. This does not sound like undergraduate work. And I... I've noticed that you know, we have so many of these that you probably think that this is normal. This is the normal amount of work that undergraduate students do in colleges. It is not what you guys do, are doing is extraordinary. So again, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing all of you present again in the spring symposium, and we can see what you guys are doing next. So thank you. <laughs>